All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our live stream Bible study here from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Germantown, Wisconsin. After taking a week off for that athletic contest, uh, and so we're back to looking at John chapter 17. We actually have a little bit to pick up from last time that we met two weeks ago. Uh, so that's, um, we're going to begin at chapter 17, verse 11. Uh, so if you're looking for the handout for that, it says the Lord's Prayer, part 2, John 17, 6 to 12. So we're just going to finish that little section um, today. And then there's a new uh, lesson that was posted in the feed uh, for you called the Lord's Prayer Part 3, uh, and it covers verses 13 to 19. So that'll kind of be the plan for this evening, trying to get through the second major division of the um, high priestly prayer or the Lord's Prayer in John 17. But let's begin our study of Jesus' prayer with our own prayers. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you our thanks and praise that you have brought us back to this place, that we might continue to grow in our understanding of your word. For we know and believe that your word is truth. Sanctify us by your truth as we study your word this evening, and equip and empower us to live lives that bring you honor and glory. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so um little... Uh, just to kind of get back into the flow of thought here, we're in John 17, the capstone of the farewell discourse in the fourth gospel. And Jesus is praying to the Father, this kind of last great prayer, the last great section of the gospel before the passion begins. And we divide, we can divide this prayer up into three different parts. Verses one through five, Jesus prays for himself. And then this middle section, verses 6 through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples. And that's where we're at. And then the last part of the prayer, um, verses 20 through 25, are Jesus prays for, the, for all believers of all time, for those that will come to faith through the work of the disciples. So remember uh, that first and foremost, Jesus is praying for the apostles, for the twelve, but uh, but that number goes beyond that 12, probably for the 70, um, these full-time disciples who follow Jesus full-time. Um, these are the people that are going to go out into the world after his resurrection and share the good news of Jesus' resurrection. And much of what is being discussed here in, in these last sections of the second main part are really looking forward to what is going to happen after that last day after or after the resurrection um, and the, the kind of work that, that these disciples are going to do, the, the mission that God has given them to do, that Jesus has given them. All right, so um, that's kind of where, we're, we're, where we are. And we're going to be picking up here in verse 11, where Jesus is going to talk about the fact that he's not going to be around much longer in the world and what he, of course, he's all, he exists forever, but he's not going to be in the world uh, much longer. And so now there's a specific petition or some prayers that are aimed at these disciples that are that are specifically uh, in on behalf of the uh, the disciples that he, he is praying for. So we, we begin reading at verse 11. Jesus says, "I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world." And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. So there's a, there's a couple of very interesting things that are going on there. First of all, uh, we have uh, one of the key terms from the gospel appearing here, the word remain. Remember, this becomes, this is very important earlier in the gospel. Jesus says, if you remain in me and I remain in you, then you will bear much fruit. Or in chapter 8, um, if, you re, if, you, if you hold to my teaching, if you remain in my teaching, then you will be my disciples and you will know the truth and truth will set you free. So now we have that same, con, that same remaining concept, but now it's negated. I'm, um, I'm not going to remain. The time for Jesus' physical presence in the world um, is, is going to end. And yet, Jesus says, 
that the disciples are not going to go with him. The disciples are going to have to remain in the world. We're going to hear a lot more about that in the next paragraph, beginning of verse 13. So the lesson that we have set aside for tonight. So I'm not necessarily going to talk any more about that. But I do want to talk about the second big point um, in this verse is the address that Jesus uses. Holy Father. This is the only place in the fourth gospel where this combination of words is used, Holy Father. And it is a very interesting combination. Uh, Because of the overtones of each of the two words. So the word holy, and again, we're going to have the chance to talk about this and the the new lesson for tonight. Um, The word holy means something is holy when it's in a class all by itself. To be holy means to be set apart from other things, right? So um, in, in, in our world today, may, maybe we set apart some, some part of something in order to, to we reserve that thing for service to God. So I'll give you an example. Um, you might, we might talk about holy communion, the elements of holy communion. Now, Jesus told us to use bread and to use wine in the Lord's Supper. And you can use any bread and you can use any wine for that purpose. But we have special bread that we have set aside and special wine that we set aside, not because it's special in and of itself, but that we've decided this bread isn't just going to be for eating. This isn't just going to be, you know, um, what we give our three-year-olds for a snack. But this is this is bread that we've set aside for the purpose. We've separated this bread from all the other bread in the world We set it aside for this purpose to use in the Lord's Supper. In a sense, that bread has been made holy. It's been set apart. It's been put in a class all by itself. No other bread is going to be used for the Lord's Supper, only this bread. Um, You can put people in classes like that. In other words, you can, if, if you wanted to, if you wanted to separate one person from a group of people, right? So maybe you'd, maybe you'd say, um, of all the people, that are watching this class now, there's one or two maybe who aren't, um, whose lawns aren't filled with snow at this particular moment. You could say that those people are holy in the sense that they are separated, they're in a class by themselves from the rest of us whose, whose lawns are very much filled with snow. Um, uh, when we are described as being holy in the Bible, it, it means that we as believers are set apart from the unbelieving world. We're set, we're set aside. We're in, we're in a different class from the unbelieving world. We're in a class by ourselves, set aside um, for service to God, to be served by God and to, be, and to serve God. But ultimately, the only being who is truly and absolutely holy is God. God is holy because there is no no one nothing that you can put in God's class, right? There's there's God is in a class all by Himself. That's what we mean. When we talk about the holiness of God. So when when Jesus calls God Holy Father, that first word holy is a very exclusive term. It's something that is absolutely true only of God. When we talk about God's holiness. We're really talking about a God who is very different than us, a God who is far away, Um, a God who is um, the the technical term is um, that he is transcendent. He's, He's beyond our comprehension. When we describe God as holy, this is what the angels are singing in Isaiah 6 at the call of Isaiah Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's in a class all by himself. Nobody can comprehend him. So that word holy emphasizes the transcendence of God, the greatness of God, the awesomeness of God, the the incomprehensibility of God. That's a good word. Um, so, uh, So that's the word holy. But then it's tied, it's connected to the word father, which is the exact opposite. This is a very intimate word. It's it's a fa- familial relationship, right? Um, when we we call on God as our Father because we know that He loves us, He wants what's best for us. Um, in the work of His Son, um, we enjoy sonship. We enjoy being children of God. 
like Jesus is a child of God. And so you, and in other words, the word father emphasizes the technical term as eminence. The fact that God is very near us. He's very close. Wherever we go, he goes with us. And so that the, the description of God as Holy Father very powerfully combines God's transcendence, holy, with his eminence, Father. He's at the same time a God that's completely different from us, his incomprehensibility, but a God who is very near to us, very close to us, because he is our dearly loved Father. Um, so it's a very it's a very interesting way of addressing God. It's a very appropriate way of dress, of, of addressing God uh, that emphasizes both his transcendence and his eminence. And then the last and the most important thing that I want to talk a little bit about um, in this verse is the last phrase um, that uh, God wants or Jesus wants God to protect the disciples who remain in the world by the power of his name. Right? So it says, use the power of your name, Lord, the name that you gave me. Um, protect them who are, st- who are going to stay in the world. And then here's the phrase, so that they may be one just as we are one. So that they may be one as we are one. What Jesus is talking about there in that verse is what we're going to talk about, what we're going to call for the, the purposes of this evening's discussion, Christian unity. Christian unity. And Christian unity, unity is something that Jesus wants. It's something that Jesus expects from his church, um, is unity. So what we want to talk about, though, is the two kind of false paths, two kind of misunderstandings of, of the idea of unity and the way that it plays out in our world today to make sure that, as is so often the case, we find the narrow Lutheran middle road between two ditches or two extremes that go too far in one direction or the other. And so um, sometimes people will appeal to a verse like this, that they may be one, Father, just as you and I are one. And they'll a, a verse like this will be used to appeal, say something like, denominational differences are insignificant, that God doesn't care about the differences between Lutherans and Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians that we should all just be one, that we should all just be one Christian church, that, that, that um, we shouldn't argue over doctrine, we shouldn't let doctrine divide us, um, that, God, that Jesus wants us to be united, and that means that we should just overlook any and all differences that exist between us. And that is not the kind of unity that Jesus has in mind here. And the way that we know that is because he says that he wants his disciples to have unity that reflects the unity that exists between him and the Father. And there are no differences between him and the Father. He and the Father are one. So Jesus wants unity in his church, but he wants it to be a real unity. He wants it to be a unity in fact, and not just one in name. And so while it is true that Jesus wants unity, There are other passages in the Bible that talk about what that unity is going to look like. And the one that especially comes to my mind, actually uses the word unity, is in 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul says that God God wants the Corinthians to be perfectly united in thought and word. Perfectly united, not mostly united, not almost perfectly united, But that's the standard. That's the kind of unity that God is looking for. God wants perfect unity. Um, He wants there to be no difference, no doctrinal difference between groups of Christians. The other passage that it comes to my mind, even though it doesn't use the word unity, um, is is the word everything and the Great Commission. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, not some of the things I've commanded you or most of the things or almost all the things I've commanded you, but he wants the unity in the church to be based on everything that he has commanded us. So any unity that is reached because we sacrifice truth um, isn't unity at all. I saw something on Facebook just recently that said that... um, that when we sacrifice truth 
on the altar of peace that we make a huge mistake. In other words, when we say, um, let's give up articles of truth just so that we can get along, um, we end up destroying the very thing that we are. And so, so one, one aspect or one ditch on one side of the road when it comes to unity is this kind of false unity, this kind of minimalistic unity that says, let's just focus on what we have in common and ignore all the things that are different. That's not the kind of unity that Jesus is looking for because he wants a unity that reflects the way that Jesus and the Father are united, where there is no difference. The Father and the Son are one. However, I think especially in our circles, this kind of verse gets in, uh, invoked the, in the other direction. Um, and what, what, what I mean by that is this unity that gets changed into something that I will call uniformity. Um, and unity does not necessarily mean that there's going to be uniformity. You can be united with someone and yet do things differently. Now, I know that there was probably a time in our church body where you could go from any church to another, and the service was probably going to be almost exactly the same. They were probably going to use the Lutheran hymnal, and they were probably going to either use page 5 or page 15. And you could, you, could, you could go on vacation to another state and go into a Welsh church, and you would expect that the worship at that Welsh church is, was going to be very similar, if not exactly the same, as your own home congregation. And there, there are some people in our church body who think that's what unity is. That unity is the fact that all of our churches do things the same way. But that's not unity, that's uniformity. And while uniformity may be a good thing, uniformity is not what Jesus is asking for in this prayer. What he's asking for is unity. And so what we have to recognize as a church body, especially a church body that isn't what it was in the 1950s and 60s, a church body that is more sensitive to the fact that we might have to change changeable aspects of our ministry to more effectively um, destroy barriers to hearing the gospel so that there might be in other places in our church body. There might be some churches that do things differently. Maybe they don't use a hymnal at all. And, and if they're not using a hymnal, they're certainly not using page 15 or page 38. We have page 15 and page 38 now um, with Christian worship. Um, maybe their pastor doesn't wear a robe. Maybe they don't have an organ. They have a praise band. Maybe... Um, Maybe their church excuses their children halfway through the service and their, and their children, they have their own little kids church while the adults have their, you know, kind of the, the regular sermon. Or uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's a church that opens up a coffee shop next to it or connected with it in the hopes of getting people to, um, to be more comfortable being on their campus. And, and there are some people in our church body who have said things like um, they are destroying the unity of the church by doing those things. That by not using a hymnal or by their pastors not wearing robes or by not doing things the way that they've always been done, that they're destroying the unity that exists within our church. That's just not true. That is making unity into uniformity. The kind of unity that Jesus wants is a real doctrinal unity, a real unity that is based on the name of God. That's what that's the basis of the prayer here. What God has revealed about himself in the word. We have no choice but to be united about such things. But where there are things that are not a part of God's name, things that we normally call adiaphora, things about which God has has made no command like whether or not our pastors wear a robe, um, then we don't have to do things exactly the same way. Now, I've used some examples that, I, that hopefully I think most of the church people, our churches and our synod have moved beyond. 
Um, I, you know, I, I, I really hope that there aren't wealth people out there who say, your church doesn't, your pastor doesn't wear a robe, therefore you're destroying the unity of the church. So that, that kind of, I, I, hopefully we're past that kind of real superficial thing. But there was a, a topic that came up in another one of the classes that I teach um, that was surprisingly um, inflammatory, at least to me, it was a little surprising, the, the kind of vehemence at which um, there was a rejection of this. And it was, uh, it was coming off the Wells Leadership Conference. You, know, you probably know there was recently a big um, Wells Leadership Conference in Chicago, attended by over 800 Wells people. Um, and one of the one of the big keynote uh, one of the keynotes uh, presentations that was made at the leadership conference was about um, how can we make the most of the role uh, of the gifts of both men and women. In other words, how can we especially get women involved in the church? Um, how can we use the gifts that God has given to the women of our of, of our church body in a way? that both honors the headship principle and yet recognizes that God gives spiritual gifts through women, um, gifts that, um, that they are able to use in order to serve God's people. Um, and the key, basically the keynote was just aimed at getting us to ask questions like, um, let's examine some of the practices that we have in the past. Are, are the practices, are our past practices um, are we doing them just because there are past practices or are we doing them because they are, they are necessary reflections of the headship principle that's laid out in the Bible. And the example that I gave that I used in the class, which I wish I hadn't now because it became a, a point of contention um, is women. Can women serve as ushers in the church? Can women serve as ushers in the church? Now, my brothers and sisters who are watching in Stoddard will vehemently say, of course it's okay for women to be ushers in the church, because in Stoddard we had women ushers. At Bethlehem, we do not have women ushers, and as soon as I suggested the idea that we have women ushers, um, you know, the, the intensity in the room began to increase. And there were several people who wanted to talk with me after class about how it's inappropriate that women should usher. Um, and so one of the things that I want to, that I just want to talk about is wh wherever you fall on that particular question, okay, and, and, and I think that every church has to wrestle with that kind of question um, themselves. In other words, different churches might reach different conclusions about whether or not ushering is an exercise of authority. I think there certainly was a time in our church body when ushering was an exercise of authority. When ushers were supposed to decide who could and could not come to communion, for example, there's a long, long history in our church where usher, where um, ushers on communion Sundays were were elders. The elders of the congregation were expected to be ushers on communion Sundays because the elders were the ones who knew who could and could uh, con who couldn't come to communion. So the the invitation to go up to communion was actually an act of authority. That isn't the case anymore at least at Bethlehem and in Stoddard, the two places where I've served, the usher's job is to make sure the right number of people go up to the table. They're not, they're not deciding who goes up to the table. They're just supposed to make sure that 14 people go up, right, so that there aren't too few or too many people that are up at the table. Okay, so um, I, I am kind of of the opinion that ushering is not necessarily, not hear what I'm saying now, especially Bethlehem people, that it's not necessarily an act of authority. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you would choose to have women ushers. But what I'm saying is that, um, that the act in and of itself is not necessarily one that, uh, that in, uh, has a th authority, uh, an act of authority within it. But this is exactly the point. This is the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate with this difference between unity and uniformity. The previous congregation that I served in Stoddard has women ushers. The congregation that I currently serve does not. But the congregation that I served and the congregation I serve now are united. There is unity between St. Matthew's and Stoddard and Bethlehem and Menominee Falls and Germantown. Even though there is not uniformity in the practice of who serves as ushers. Right? Um, and to demand 
and, and this is where I think uh, what, what tends to happen is churches like Bethlehem tend to say that churches like St. Matthew's and Stoddard are going off the rails. You never believe what they're doing down there in Stoddard because they're letting women usher. They obviously are destroying the unity of the church. No, they're not. We don't have to have uniformity in our practice in things about which God has not spoken and things that are adiaphora. And so on one ditch, in other words, what I'm saying, on one side of the, of, the, of the one ditch that we have to avoid is the ditch that says, let's just have unity at all costs. Forget about truth. What matters is unity. Well, we don't want to do that because God wants the unity that we have to be real unity. But on the other hand, we don't want to, to limit unity to uniformity. To demand that unity means that we all do everything exactly the same way, that every Welsh church handles every issue in exactly the same way. Um, and, and we want to find the narrow Lutheran road between those two things. We always have to be asking ourselves, is this something that God has spoken about? Is it an authoritative act? Or may, and, and a lot of times, and, and this I think is a good point, um, that people from Bethlehem have made to me is that perception is reality. If in a congregation, ushering is perceived to be an act of authority, then it is an act of authority. And, and that is going to have to, as, you know, that's why every congregation has to wrestle with it. We can't make a decision for every congregation whether they can have women ushers or not. Every congregation has to make that decision individually. Every congregation has to decide whether their pastor is going to wear a robe or not. Or is he going to be able to wear black or white or not? Is he going to wear black with a stole or not? Those are, those are all things that, that may, may mean something in one congregation that they don't mean in another. But that just because we aren't uniform in our practice doesn't mean that we're not united in the name of God, in, in the name of what we teach. So I just wanted to take this, uh, this opportunity. This is the most famous verse. This is, this is the Sedes Doctrina for the unity of the church, that, um, that God wants us to be one just as he and the Father are one. And, and what that means is that we want to stay away from those two ditches, from a false unity that it sacrifices truth for the sake of being, quote-unquote, united, but on the other side, insisting that unity implies uniformity. Okay, so hoping, I, hoping that I didn't open too large of a can of worms, I want to give you a chance to ask any questions or make comments about that issue. About um, what real unity in the church is and isn't. All right, either you guys are tired or um, that wasn't as controversial as I thought it was going to be. Uh, but if, um, if you're typing something, feel free to keep typing, obviously, um, and send it, and we'll, we can circle back to picking it up. Rachel? I'm not really sure how to ask this, but in congregations, sometimes you see people with different opinions, and especially like maybe when it comes to the direction a church is going or things of that nature, and how do you, how do you keep unity while still allowing for dialogue and perhaps constructive conflict? I don't know, is that a, a good way of putting it? All right, so Rachel asked the question, how, do you, how does a congregation handle this, this desire? Not, it's not a desire, the command for unity, right? God's desire for unity. And because God desires it, we too desire it. How, do you, how does a congregation handle it when there are very real differences within a congregation about an issue when a congregation is really divided about an issue how do you how do you go about that and um i wish there were a book that's that gave an answer to that question and i i wish i could write the book because then i'd be rich because then i could just sell it to every congregation because that's the question that every congregation has to wrestle with right um so let's say a couple of things we always want to wrestle. This is something that I got from Professor Gurgle, and who knows whether who, who he got it from, but um, this is something that I think about a lot. When, we, when we're thinking about what we do as a church, what we do, when we talk about what we do, 
we always want to ask ourselves the question, why do we do it? Okay? In other words, we don't want to do things just because that's the way we do them. That's not a good reason to do something, because that's the way you do it. Um, so the question is, when you, when you have any practice in the church, whatever practice you're thinking about, is going to fall into one of three categories. Is it something that must not change? Is it something that may or may not change? Or is it something that must change? Okay, those are the three categories. Is it something that must not change, something that may or may not change, or something that must change? And the reason that I like to start there is because if the issue falls into either category one, must not change, or category three, must change, there really can't even be a discussion. Either it must not change or it must, right? So the very first step is to decide, is this, a, is this a necessary issue one way or the other? Okay, so let me illustrate that. Um, on one side, let's just say uh, we would, we'd have some people in our church that would suggest something like, um, the way that our church body has understood the, the headship principle is not supported by Scripture. That the Wells teaching on the headship principle is unscri unscriptural, that we should change our understanding of the headship principle. Okay, to me, that falls under the category of must not change. You'd have to show me from scripture why the standard interpretation or understanding of the headship principle that we have had in the history of our church isn't what we've always had in the history of our church. So in other words, the reason that we have it is not because we've always had it, but because it's, re it's, it's based on the scriptural passages. Almost always the, in the category of what must not change, what must not change is the word, right? The content of what we preach that cannot change. I think what's more difficult is when we get into the into things about what must change, um, because... Uh, there, that might be, there might be some debate about whether that thing must change. But let me give you another example from the leadership conference. Um, uh, Pastor Hine, uh, there are many Pastor Hines, so I forget which one, John Hine. Pastor John Hine has, um, has been asked by our synod to do a lot of work. Uh, uh, he is now the head of a, of a new task force in our church body called the Commission for Congregational Counseling. And uh, he, he invested a year of his life into studying the trends that are going on in our, in, in our church body, the direction our church body is going. And the, what he discovered about the trends that our church body, the, the, the trends are very disturbing. Um, for example, if we continue losing the number of members at the rate that we are currently losing members, the wells will cease to exist by 2050. Okay, 30 years from now, if we lose as many members this year or every year as we, let, as we lost in 2018, obviously we haven't done all the numbers for 2019 yet, but if we lose as many people as we lost in, in, in the the, the the curve stays the same as it has the past decade or so, then the Synod won't exist in 2050. Um, so something's got to change there. That's what, that's what Pastor Hines' big takeaway from that is. Something's got to change. We can't just keep doing what we've always done and expect to get vastly different results. We have to do something different. What we cannot change is the message that we proclaim. Um, um, the, the what of our ministry cannot change, but can the how of our ministry change? Pastor Hine would say not only can it, it must. Okay. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going back, um, picking up a quote, uh, a comment here from Don Mallow. Another example of women's involvement. I think about some women at Bethlehem who have helped us in the marketing and promotional Bible studies. As pastors are aware, we were careful that the members of Bethlehem didn't perceive that the women were leaders and or the decision makers. So this is, um, I'm glad that Don brought this up. This is a, a great example of letting, uh, allowing, or not just allowing, 
of asking people who have gifts that no one else on our board or committee had, which is marketing. I mean, it turns out that one of the wives of one of our board members, what they what she does for a living is marketing. And so we said, you know, what would be a good idea is to have her come and give us some advice about how we can do a better job of getting word out to our congregation about the Bible study opportunities that we have here at Bethlehem, because there are tons. I mean, there just there are, are so many opportunities here at Bethlehem to study God's word. Um, and we think a lot of times people just aren't aware of all the different options that they have. When we invited his wife to come, she, she never uh, exercised any kind of authority. She never told us what we should do. She was never a part of the vote about what we should do. Um, she was purely what we called an advisory member, an advisory member of, of, the, of the board. We, we said, hey, her name was Andrea. Hey, Andrea, what do you think about this? And then she would tell us what she thought about that. And then, you know, based on what she thought about that, we would, we would make a decision about what we would do about that thing. Um, I think that every board and committee at Bethlehem should have, or in the Wells, should have a woman in, involved. I, I just, I don't think that there is any reason why women can't serve as advisory members of, of boards and committees. I'm not saying put women on your church councils. I'm not saying um, have women vote in your voters' meetings. Those, those are things that would, would violate the headship principle, at least the way they're normally carried out in our congregation, depending on how your congregation is, is organized, right? But... For us, to, for us to think that the women, the women in our congregation have nothing to give to the way that we plan the, the ministry that we do, I think is, not only is it kind of naive, um, it, it's just wrong. In other words, it's saying to God, we don't think that you can give gifts through 51% of our congregation, that you have limited gifts to the to 49 percent of our congregation um so uh and, and so just uh heidi has a comment here i appreciate the comment don I'd like to point out that there are women in positions of allowable leadership at bethlehem that encourage christian growth that's that is the case right um for example women teachers women teachers um they um promote christian growth women teachers teach authoritatively they just don't do so they don't want to teach authoritatively over men in our congregation and i don't really want this to devolve into a bible study on the headship principle which we could certainly do sometime um that's not what i have in mind here um but i guess what, what i'm trying to get at is beth i i wonder if the reason bethlehem doesn't have any women on any of its boards advisory members on its boards is because it's never had women on its boards before that's not a good reason not to have women on your boards. It's because we've never had women on our boards before. If you say we're not going to have women serve on our boards because our boards lead the direction of our congregation and they do so in a, in a way that in, it requires the exercise of authority, fine. Then the, you shouldn't have women on your boards and committees. Um, but if women can be a part of your board and committee without exercising authority over men in that, in that setting, then why wouldn't you want their impact? Why wouldn't you want their gifts and their experiences to be a part of what, of what uh, you can bring to the table? Again, that's something that every congregation has to wrestle with um, themselves. Every congregation is going to have to have wrestle with that issue about how can we incorporate, how can we get women involved in a way um, that uh, in, in a way that re respects the edge of principle. So Heidi has, I can visualize women ushers whose purpose would be to assist crying babies and distressed families and things like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe we don't call them ushers then, right? Maybe we call them helpers or maybe we call them super women um, who come to the rescue. Um, uh, and, I, and, and believe me, I think most of our men ushers would be more than happy to, to let, let them do that. So, um, 
it's, but it, getting back to Rachel's original question is how do you handle this? Let's just say we get um, to something that is in the middle there. What what may or may not change? Unless well, since we're using it as an example, and even though I didn't really want to use it, let's use it. Let's use the example of women ushers. Um, can can a can a Christian congregation, can a Wells congregation have women ushers? Well, that is a question. That is something that may or may not change. I, I, I think a congregation in good conscience could decide we're going to change the practice, the historic practice of our church, and we are going to allow women ushers. Um, because ushering has no exercise of authority. An usher's job is to hand a bulletin to you as you walk in and to help the plates go down alternate rows. Okay, um, That is maybe the, the, the be-all and end-all of what an usher does. Um, if, and if that's the case, the, I, don't, I don't see why there would be any reason why you wouldn't want to, why a woman wouldn't be able to do that. I'll say it that way. There might be reasons why you wouldn't want them to, but but the, I, I'd, be, I'd be hesitant to say there's any there's a reason why they shouldn't be able to, right? Um, so when you have an an item like that, especially a divisive issue like this, the first thing that we always have to remember, the first thing we always want to talk about is let the law of love reign. Remember that ev- that love always dictates what we do as Jesus disciples. That's a part of the farewell discourse, right? This is how that they will know that you are my disciples, the way that you love one another. Remember what Christian love does. Christian love puts the interests or needs of others before their own interests or needs. Um, And so what Christian love does, first and foremost, is it seeks to understand the other perspective. You try to put yourself in the place of the other group. And try to say to yourself, why would it be, why would Pastor Arnold want this strange idea of having women usher? Or maybe from my chair, I put myself in the frame of mind, why, can I imagine why it would make men in our congregation uncomfortable to have women ushers? That is what love does, is it tries to understand the perspective of the other side. Then, in love, you have a discussion. You have a discussion about what the principles are, the things that cannot change. You have discussions about the applications of the way those principles have been in the past. And then you have discussions about how they might be in the future. And uh, and then you move forward. At some point, Uh, One group says to the other, out of love, we will defer to you at this time. Um, I I do think that there, in the church, we should, you know, to borrow a a term from the business world, that we should think win-win, that it shouldn't be, um, I'm, my agenda is going to trump or defeat your agenda, right? That I'm going to win and you're going to lose, doesn't have to be, we don't have to have that win-lose mentality. We can have a win-win mentality. We can find a way um, where women can serve and the headship principle can be respected. That's ideal, right? That's the kind of situation we want. Or um, let, let's just take it to a different realm, the realm of worship. What, what is our worship going to look like? Is our worship going to look very traditional you know, is it going to look like it did in 1950, where everything was everything and, and, and every only is is done led by the organ? All a congregation is singing is led by the organ, and there isn't going to be any music that was written after the in the 20th century. Um, just going to be all Lutheran hymns from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. You know, is is, is worship going to look like that? Are pastors going to be dressed in white robes with stoles and chasubles, and are we going to have? crucifers and lucifers in our church that are carrying crosses and lights, um, super high church, or are, are we going to we're going to get rid of all that thing and we're going to get rid of all the hymnals, we're going to put everything up on a screen and we are going to, um, pastors are going to wear um, blue jeans and they're going to sit on a stool and we're going to get rid of altars, we're going to have a stage and, um, you know, that's super, super low church. Which is it going to look like? Well, why does it have to be one or the other, right? Why does it have to be one or the other? 
Um, why can't we have elements, can, uh, elements of traditional historic Lutheran worship intermingled with or mixed together with more contemporary elements? Why does it have to be one or the other? We don't have to think win-lose. We can think win-win. And that's what the law of love does. The law of love is always seeking the best interest of others, not what we want, but what others need. That's what love does. And I, I really think that if a congregation is wrestling with an issue and love is the, is the dominant driving force behind that issue, that wherever you end up will be a good place. Um, and now, is that really an answer to Rachel's question? I'm not sure it is, in the sense that I can't, I, I can't tell you that these are the steps necessarily that you take. Um, you, you, you wrestle together as brothers, brothers and sisters in Christian love. You recognize that you can't do things, um, you can't at the same time have women ushers and not have women ushers, right? It's, gotta be, it's gonna have to be one way or the other. Um, and, and, and the side that doesn't get its way is not going to take its ball and go home, you know. Um, so that, that, that would be my answer. That, uh, first of all, to say, is this something that may or may not change? Because if it's in the realm of must or must not change, then the discussion's over, right? So first, is it in the realm of something that may or may not change? And then as you have that discussion, let Christian love that seeks the best interest or the, the needs of others be the guide um, for how you go about doing these things. Now, Doreen has the kind of great explanation and reminder of Christian love is just in case you've forgotten, um, this can be PA 1 3. Um, so PA 1 1 is a text without its context becomes a pretext or a proof text. And uh, PA 1 2 is wherever you see the word therefore, ask yourself what is the therefore, therefore. Um, PA 1.3 can be the definition of love. Love does what's in the best interest of the one loved, regardless of the cost to the one loving. That's what Christian love is. Christian love is doing what's in the best interest of the one loved, regardless of the cost to the one loving. So think about how God loved us. God wanted what was in our best interest which is that we spend eternity with him in heaven instead of eternity separated from him in hell. He wanted what was in our best interest, regardless of what it cost him. It cost him the most valuable thing he has, his one and only son. So that is the greatest example of love that you can find. Love has no greater example than this, that one would give life, one's life for one's friends. But what God does is that he gives his life for his enemies, Right? So Christian love does what is in the best interest of the one love, regardless of the cost of the one loving. We probably shouldn't call it PA11. We should probably call it um, DD11, Daniel Deutschleiter11, because that is where I got that from. But then again, if I can't claim anything, if, if I can't claim those things as my own, then I can never claim anything, because really nothing that I say to you is original. Um, at least nothing good I say to you original. It's all stuff that I've stolen from other people. So... Okay, um, we have one more verse in this section. That's where we'll kind of um, end up with this evening. We have verse 12, um, where Jesus says, While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. So a couple of things we want to say about this passage, about what it is saying and what, is it, what it isn't saying. What it is saying is it is talking about the power of God's name to save. So remember, throughout these verses, we have God's name is in play. Remember, God's name is everything he's revealed about himself to us in the Bible. Um, so God, it is the, by the name of God or by the power of God that we become believers. It's the name of God or the power of God that we remain believers. It's the name of God and by the power of God that we will reach the consummation of being believers, which is the eternal life that exists um, for us in heaven. And Jesus says that his faithfulness, the, his work of guarding and protecting, using the name that God has given him, has been perfect. That, that he has not lost a single one, that Jesus is batting a thousand. 
um, or that Jesus has never, never missed. He's never lost one that God has entrusted into his hands. And Jesus says, if you might say, well, what about Judas? That's the one doomed to destruction. What about him? Well, Jesus says, remember um, that he didn't count. Remember that he is, he is not one of those to whom the Father gave me. He's not one of my sheep. He reveals himself to be an unbeliever by his rejection. What we don't want to say, sometimes this verse is used by Calvinists to prove that there are people that God wants to be damned. And, and they'll use Judas as an example of that. Um, God did not want Judas to be damned. And there is no passage, there is no Old Testament passage that said that Judas would be damned. There is a passage that says that one of Jesus' own disciples would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And it was necessary that one of Jesus' disciples fulfill that prophecy. It is true that Jesus knew, even from the beginning, who that one was going to be. Think about how many times... I think it's three times in the fourth gospel that whenever Judas is mentioned, we get the little reminder. This is the one that, who betrayed Jesus. Um, Jesus knew from the beginning when he called Judas, the moment that he called Judas, he knew that he was going to be the one who would betray him. But the, but the reason that Judas betrayed was not because Judas was doomed to, not because Judas had to, not because he was predestined to destruction. There is no predestination to destruction. Um, there is no being doomed to destruction. Um, it is the natural consequence of unbelief. In that sense, you can say it is the doom of all unbelievers to be destroyed. It is the destiny of unbelievers to be destroyed because that is the natural consequence of unbelief, the natural consequence of rejection. But the reason that Judas rejected is not because he was, because it was preordained that he rejected. But his rejection fulfilled something that was preordained, which was the rejection of one of Jesus, um, that one of Jesus' own friends would reject him. So um, just to kind of keep that in mind, uh, that Jesus, this very last thought in this paragraph is that Jesus says, not a single one that you have entrusted to me has been lost. Jesus is batting a thousand when it comes to protecting those um, that God has given to him. The reason that I want you to remember that is because that is very much in, in thought. That is the thought against which verse 13 pushes. Okay, verse 13 is going, to, is going to launch from this place that God has entrusted to Jesus this group of disciples, this 70, these 70 disciples, this larger group of disciples. God has entrusted these disciples into Jesus' hands, and during his earthly ministry, Jesus has protected every single one of them so that not one is lost. But verse 13, but now I'm going away, God, and so now here is my petition. Now you protect them, because the time for me protecting them has come to an end. Okay, so that's your little preview of what's going to come next in, in verse 13. Um, I do want to end a little early tonight just to let you know that we are not going to meet next week. Next Sunday, we're not going to, to have our, our normal Sunday night class. Um, I have a, a medical procedure that I'm undergoing. It's nothing difficult. It's very routine, uh, but I will need the, the weekend there to recover from that. So we're not going to be meeting a week from today. So the next time I see you online will be two weeks from today. And we'll pick up um, where we left off here with verse 13. And uh, I want you to, we'll uh, for sure try to finish the second part of the prayer where Jesus prays for the disciples and then begin the third part where Jesus prays for all believers of all time. But with that in mind, let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much, and God's richest blessings to you in this new week of grace.